Hello and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're in Nehemiah chapter 10 today. Father, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's read, let's read verse 1 of chapter 10. It says, Now those who placed their seal on the document were Nehemiah the governor, the son of Hekeliah, and Zedekiah, and let's just stop there because I'm not going to read the next 27 verses. Uh, these verses contain the list of men who signed the agreement that we looked at with God. Um, and it included Nehemiah. It included the priests, the Levites, and the leaders of the people. Um, let's go down now to verse 28 where it says, Now the rest of the people... The priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the Nethanim, and all those who had separated themselves from the peoples of the lands to the law of God, their wives, their sons, and their daughters, everyone who had knowledge and understanding. These joined with their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and to do all the commandments of the Lord our God and his ordinances and his statutes. So the leaders signed the agreement, and the rest of the people agreed with the promises as well. They all promised to obey the laws of God. Verse 30. We would not give our daughters as wives to the peoples of the land, nor take their daughters for our sons. Most foreigners served other gods, which were not real gods at all. They were idols. They, in effect, were demons. And God didn't want his people to marry those types of people because he knew that his people would not influence them for good, but instead they would influence his people for bad. Verse 31. If the peoples of the land brought wares or any grain to sell on the Sabbath day, we would not buy it from them on the Sabbath or on a holy day, and we would forego the seventh year's produce and the exacting of every debt. So they promised to obey the Sabbath law, and that meant that they couldn't work on the seventh day, and it also meant that they couldn't work on the seventh year. They couldn't plant their crops, in other words, every seventh year. God wanted them to take every seventh day off. God wanted them to take every seventh year off and depend on him, trust that he would provide enough food without them even working. You know, they really did have a good setup if they obeyed the Lord. I, can you imagine always getting one in seven days off a lot of people work seven days a week. I mean, this would be such an upgrade. And then could you imagine, even further, could you imagine getting one in seven years off? That would really be amazing. And God would take care of them, too, as long as they obeyed him. Verse 32. Also we made ordinances for ourselves to exact from ourselves yearly one-third of a shekel for the service of the house of our God. They promised to support the true religion with their offerings. And you can tell right there that they were on fire for God at this point, because if people care about God, then they're going to give to God's work. You have, you have spiritual freeloaders, Christians who never give, never ever give, or throw a buck they throw a dollar in the offering basket because that's what their moms did back in 1960. You know, throw a buck in the offering and then go out to dinner after, or go out to breakfast after church and drop 40 bucks. Tells you where their heart is, doesn't it? Verse 32. Also, we made ordinances for ourselves to exact from ourselves yearly one third of a shekel for the service of the house of our God. They, they promised to support the true religion, as I said. 
And then it says in verse 33, for the showbread, for the regular grain offering, for the regular burnt offering of the Sabbaths, the new moons, and the set feast, for the holy things, for the sin offerings, to make atonement for Israel and all the work of the house of our God. Something for nothing isn't a biblical idea. Someone has to pay, and they were willing to pay for the upkeep and the work of the ministry in the true religion of God. Verse 34, we cast lots among the priests, the Levites, and the people for bringing the wood offering unto the house of our God, according to our fathers' houses at the appointed times year by year, to burn on the altar of the Lord our God as it is written in the law. So even hauling wood, cutting wood and hauling wood, that was a spiritual work of God. Manual labor of any kind is spiritual labor when it is done to please God. So you carry firewood, which is what they were doing. Fire, carrying firewood is a ministry when you do it the best you can to honor God. 35. And we made ordinances to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all the fruit of all the trees year by year to the house of the Lord. They will give God the first part of every single harvest. They will do that because God deserved it. And they will do that so they do not forget that their food comes from the Lord. That's the importance of saying thankful, thank you. And that's the importance of tithing, giving right off the top of your paycheck to the work of the Lord, because it reminds you of what's really important. 36, to bring the firstborn of our sons and our cattle, as it is written in the law, and the firstborn of our herds and our flocks to the house of our God, to the priest who minister in the house of our God. So they offer all their firstborn livestock to God and also a sacrifice on behalf of their children. 37, to bring the first fruits of our dough, our offerings, the fruit from all kinds of trees, the new wine, the oil, to the priest, to the storerooms of the house of our God, and to bring the tithes of our land to the Levites, for the Levites should receive the tithes of all our farming communities. So these offerings were important because they were for the ministers to live on. In verse 38, And the priest, the descendant of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive tithes, and the Levites shall bring up a tenth of the tithes to the house of our God, to the rooms of the storehouse. So the priests were in charge of all the offerings. They then would distribute them among the Levites. Verse 39, for the children of Israel and the children of Levi shall bring the offering of the grain, of the new wine, and of the oil to the storerooms where the articles of the sanctuary are, where the priests who minister and the gatekeepers and the singers are, and we will not neglect the house of our God. So they were promising to act like responsible adults, adults who knew the Lord and therefore were to do their part in sustaining the religion of God. Let's move into chapter 12. It says, now these are the priests and the Levites who came up with Zerubbabel, the son of Sheotil, and Jeshua, Sariah, Jeremiah, Ezra. Let's just stop there for a second. Verses 1 through 26 contain the names of the priests and the Levites who returned to the land of Israel. Um, verses, let's go, skip down to verse 27. Hazer, Shuel, Beer, whoops. I skip back into chapter 11. Let's go into chapter 12, verse 27. It says, Now at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought out the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness, both with thanksgivings and singing, with cymbals and stringed instruments and harps. And the sons of the singers gathered together from the countryside around Jerusalem 
from the villages of Neto Heights, from the house of Gilgal, and from the fields of Giba and As Maveth, for the singers had built themselves villages all around Jerusalem. It was the job of the Levites to lead praise and worship to God. The people were very happy because they were back in the Holy Land. The walls of Jerusalem were rebuilt, and they knew God made it all happen. And that's why they celebrated this time of thanksgiving. I'm not going to read verses 31 through 37. I'll just say that the leaders of the people marched around the top of the wall playing instruments and thanking God. So this was a, a great time of celebration. Verses 38 through 30 and 39, I should say. Um, we see that a second group walked around the top of the wall in the opposite direction, praising and thanking God as well. And then in verses 40 through 43, the two groups met at the temple where they and all the people worshipped God. So this was quite a wonderful celebration. 44. And at the same time, some were appointed over the rooms of the storehouse for the offerings, the first fruits, and the tithes, to gather into them from the fields of the cities the portions specified by the law for the priests and Levites. For Judah rejoiced over the priests and Levites who ministered. 45. Both the singers and the gatekeepers kept the charge of their God and the charge of the purification according to the command of David and Solomon his son. For in the days of David and Asaph of old, there were chiefs of the singers and songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. In the days of Zerubbabel and in the days of Nehemiah, all Israel gave the portions for the singers and the gatekeepers, a portion for each day. They also consecrated holy things for the Levites, and the Levites consecrated them for the children of Aaron. The people promised not to neglect the temple and the ministers. They put a plan in place which included appointing people to collect the offerings and put them in the storehouses. Let's go into chapter 13, verse 1. It says, On that day they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people. And it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever come into the assembly of God. So the people were taught the Bible, and once again, they realized that they had been sinning. The Ammonites and the Moabites were longtime enemies of the Jews. They were idolaters, and they led God's people into idolatry. And for that reason, God said, Israel, do not let them join you. Verse 2, guess what happened? Because they had not met the children of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. However, our God turned the curse into a blessing. Remember when that happened? The Ammonites, the Moabites, tried to hurt God's people through occult practices back when they were traveling through the wilderness. And it didn't work because God saved them. But the point is they tried. They were against God. They were bad people. Verse 3, so it was when they had heard the law that they separated all the mixed multitude from Israel. God cares about all people. And he would have welcomed any Moabite or Ammonite who would repent. But God loves his children also. And consequently, he didn't want any impenitent sinner among them, corrupting them. Verse 4. Now before this, Elishib, the priest, having authority over the storerooms of the house of our God, was allied with Tobiah. And he had prepared for him a large room where previously they had stored the grain offerings, the frankincense, the articles, the tithes of grain, the new wine and oil, 
which were commanded to be given to the Levites and singers and gatekeepers, and the offerings for the priests. So while Nehemiah was living in Persia, the priest Eliashib allowed an Ammonite, a bad one, who had opposed the rebuilding of of the Jerusalem wall, he allowed that man, Tobiah, to live in the temple complex. Verse 6, But during all this I was not in Jerusalem, for in the thirty-second year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Then after certain days I obtained leave from the king, and I came to Jerusalem and discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah in preparing a room for him in the courts of the house of God, and it grieved me bitterly. Therefore I threw all the household goods of Tobiah out of the room. Then I commanded them to cleanse the rooms, and I brought back the house of God, excuse me, and I brought back into them the articles of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. So Nehemiah, he was generally a nice guy, very thoughtful, very kind, very unselfish, a very good servant. But he hated sin. And that's because he loved God. And as a result, he threw that Ammonite right out of the temple, threw him right on into the street. 10. I also realized that the portions for the Levites had not been given them, for each of the Levites and the singers who did the work had gone back to his field. So I contended with the rulers and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. The people had promised God that they would bring their tithes and offerings to the temple, but they broke their promise. As a result, the ministers, the Levites, had to leave the temple work and work a secular job to have their needs met. And the result of that was that the temple and the ministry suffered. It's always the case. If people don't support those who are communicating the Word of God, then The Word of God isn't communicated like it otherwise could be. Verse 12, you know what's really sad is that many ministers and even pastors, there are good ones who love the Lord and want to serve the people, but there are many pastors, many ministers so-called who are raking in big bucks and they're not teaching the Word of God. Verse 12, then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain and the new wine and the oil to the storehouse. And I appointed as treasurers over the storehouse Shelemiah, the priest, and Zadok, the scribe, and of the Levites, Pedadiah, and next to them was Hanan, the son of Zachur, the son of Mataniah, for they were considered faithful, and their task was was to distribute to their brethren." The people once again began bringing their tithes and offering to the temple. Nehemiah put honest men in charge of the offerings. 14. Remember me, O my God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for its services. And Nehemiah was a man of prayer. So he prayed that the offerings would continue to come in for the work of God. Verse 15, In those days I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and loading donkeys with wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of burdens which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I warned them about the day on which they were selling provisions. Nehemiah was a spiritual policeman. He had to be because the people were doing many things wrong. They were working on the Sabbath, which was a sin, so Nehemiah confronted them about that. It was one thing after another. Verse 16, Men of Tyre dwelt there also, who brought in fish and all kinds of goods and sold them on the Sabbath to the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. And the seventh day was a special day. It was to be devoted to rest and worship, but the people were treating it as if it was a day like any other day. You say, well, it was just a day. What's the big deal? It was one of the reasons that the Israelites were sent into captivity, 
to Babylon for 70 years because they did not observe the Sabbath. They didn't trust God to take care of their needs. They thought they had to work seven days a week. It was greed. This is a sin of greed, as well as neglecting the worship of God. Verse 17. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said to them, What evil thing is this that you do by which you profane the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers do thus? And did not our God bring all this disaster on us and on this city? Yet you bring added wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. God had punished Israel earlier because they didn't keep the Sabbaths. And here they are committing the same sin. And what's worse is the leadership didn't stop them. Didn't tell them that they were wrong. And what good is a leader, especially a spiritual leader, who doesn't lead with the word of God as his guide? What good is he? He's no good. Absolutely no good at all. <clears throat> Verse 19. So it was at the gates of Jerusalem, as it began to be dark before the Sabbath, that I commanded the gates to be shut and charged that they must not be opened till after the Sabbath. Then I posted some of my servants at the gates so that no burdens would be brought in on the Sabbath day. Now the merchants and sellers of all kinds of wares lodged outside Jerusalem once or twice. Then I warned them, and said to them, Why do you spend the night around the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. And from that time on, they came no more on the Sabbath. And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves, and that they should go and guard the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. Remember me, O my God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the greatness of your mercy." The people wouldn't obey God on their own. So Nehemiah legislated morality. And it was right for him as a leader to do that because the ongoing sin of a few can ruin an entire nation. It's the job of a leader to legislate morality. Everybody legislates morality. The only question, whose morality are you going to legislate? Your own? Popular opinion? Or God's. And I suggest to you that God's is the morality that should always be legislated since leaders, whether they realize it or not, will stand before God and give an account of how they did their job. 23. In those days I also saw Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab, and half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod and could not speak the language of Judah but spoke according to the language of one or the other people. God had ordered his people not to marry the heathen. His people promised they wouldn't, but they did anyway. And this was a terrible sin, which if allowed to go on, would lead to corruption and idolatry throughout all the land of Israel. 25. So I contended with them and cursed them, struck some of them and pulled out their hair and made them swear by God, saying, You shall not give your daughters as wives to, your, to their sons, nor take their daughters for your sons or yourselves. How do you like that? Nehemiah meant business when it came to opposing sin, didn't he? In Israel, it was against the law to sin. And so he enforced that law. The punishment was harsh, but the people knew he was right, so they fell in line. He had God on him and his side. This was a theocracy, not a democracy. This was a theocracy, not a monarchy. Unless you want to call it a theocratic monarchy with God being the king. Verse 26, Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations there was no king like him who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, pagan women caused even him to sin. They had not learned from Israel's past mistakes. And so they repeated them. And Nehemiah had to teach them the hard way. But at least he knew the word of God, and at least he was willing to enforce it. He was their best friend, even though they probably couldn't stand him. 
27. Should we then hear of your doing all this great evil transgressing against our God by marrying pagan women? What don't they understand about do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers? What is so hard about that command to understand you are not to marry the heathen? It's not that difficult. You don't have to go to Bible college for eight years to figure that one out. And it's not right for a Christian to marry a non-Christian today. It's just not right. It is unfaithfulness to God for a Christian to do that. 28. And one of the sons of Jehoiada, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was a son-in-law of Sanballat, the Horonite. Therefore I drove him from me. The grandson of Eliashib, the chief priest, was involved in a mixed marriage. Nehemiah wouldn't have anything to do with that sinner either. He didn't care who his pa was or his grandfather was. 29. Remember them, O my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. Thus I cleanse them of everything pagan. I also assign duties to the priest and the Levites, each to his service and to bringing the wood offering and the first fruits at appointed times. Remember me, O oh my God, for my good, or for good. Nehemiah was a blessing to Israel, whether they appreciated him or not. Whether they appreciated him or not. They were fortunate to have someone who cared enough about God and them to communicate the word of God and to enforce what was right in the eyes of God. He fought sinful corruption at every level because he wanted God's people to succeed now that they were back in the land. He didn't want them to revert back to their old ways, although they sure did, time and time again. But he kept trying to put a stop to it. (coughs) Excuse me. If you want to be a part of this ministry, you can be. Your prayers and financial support are greatly appreciated. Our address is Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box 2211, Wasser, Wisconsin, 54402-2211. Again, that's Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box 2211, Wasser, Wisconsin, 54402-2211. Don't forget to check out the Scripture Verse by Verse website. I say it every time. But it's so important if you're hungry for the Word of God and you want to be taught the Word of God and only the Word of God, then go to the BibleVerseByVerse.com. That's the Scripture Verse by Verse website at the BibleVerseByVerse.com because there you will be taught the Word of God. Every verse from Genesis to Revelation. Study the whole works more than once like you're doing right now with me, using my audio Bible commentaries. We'll have a good time together. Study the Word of God. It's the most important thing that you can do. It's the most important thing on earth, the written Word of God. And again, that can be found at the BibleVerseByVerse.com. And one more time, our address is Scripture Verse by Verse, Post Office Box 2211, Wasa, Wisconsin, 54402-2211. Until next time. Michael Moret for Scripture, verse by verse. So long, everyone. Thank you.